Hello, and thank you for joining me for this very special edition of Latitude Photography Podcast. It's been a while now. I've been thinking, what in the world could I do to really mark this occasion? 100 episodes of this show, and I'm just thrilled to have you here. I'm thrilled to have this conversation with Dr. Gusky, and I just, there's so many cool things that are going on that are going to be unraveled and unfolded here in this episode. Now, we did have this conversation in mid-August of 2020, and it, now I'm only releasing it here in December, uh, late December of 2020. So please do keep that in mind when you hear. There's a, just a couple of things that are mentioned that are basically rather time-sensitive. So I just ask you, keep that in mind, and I'm, I'm sure things will make sense. This conversation is about the power of serendipity, and Dr. Gusky leads me through an experience he had that unraveled over several years where he ended up finding the last remaining remnants of evidence that points to the impact that was had on World War I by the only African, and this is all African American unit that was actually over there in France during World War I. And so as this is a special episode, I am withholding any other announcements or things like that. If you are watching here on YouTube, please do consider listening to the show. I've got, you know, 100 episodes now over there in your favorite podcast player. Just look up Latitude Photography Podcast. And we will also have these photos showing up in the Facebook group. So if you're just listening on audio, we will have those photos in the Facebook group and on the show notes website. So you can look over there. All images are copyright Dr. Jeff Gusky. And one last thing I guess to, to mention, if you're listening on the audio and you want to head over and watch it on YouTube, it is the very first link under the useful links items there right at the top or towards the top of the show notes. Thanks again so much for being here and let's just hop on over to this fantastic conversation with Dr. Gusky. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at Latitude Photography Podcast. And I've got a special guest with me. His name is Jeff Gusky. He's a photographer. He's a physician and so much more. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the show. It's such a, a, an honor to be with you today, Brent. Thank you. And the conversation that we're going to have today is just when I first learned about what this is, it, we're talking about, ultimately, we're going to get to this idea of World War I and some photography that you did on a site that, that is very just integral to our understanding of people, of what was going on at the time. And when I just saw these images, I saw the story unfolding, and I was just like, uh, this is amazing. So I really, I, we're just going to learn so much. I know I am going to learn a ton today, and I know the listeners and the viewers are going to also uh, be learning so much of just something I think we probably never even knew about. And so thank you for sharing that with us today. Before we get started into that, what I would love to invite you to do is tell us a little bit of your background, a little bit of you as a person, as a photographer, and of course, we'll then bridge it to uh, the main topic of today, which is which are these uh, these World War I soldiers. And there's something special about these World War I soldiers, so I'm kind of holding that off for you to tell us what that is, but give us that that couple of minutes, whatever you want to share Thank with, you. so we can understand who you are and how this came to be. Well, first, let me say, you know, in this time of COVID, I hope that uh, all of your listeners are safe and their families are safe yeah. and uh, really uh, honored to be with you all today. Uh, I am uh, a, an emergency physician, National Geographic photographer and an explorer. I still practice medicine and I'm very focused now on COVID and trying to find a solution for COVID that uh, could help many, many people. And uh, I currently have uh, participation in a large exhibit at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., near the White House. And I love to say this, no offense to Oprah, but they took out Oprah's exhibit and put this oh, no. exhibit in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, uh, and, 
and so my journey uh, begins by serendipity. And, and I wanted to suggest that the theme of, of our visit today uh, be about the power of serendipity for photographers. And it, it's just beyond anything I can put into words how often, starting from little coincidences, big discoveries are made and and so i'd like to share with your audience uh, where my journey begins which yeah. is when uh um uh, can i uh show you some images please yeah that'd be great okay so in 1995 i go to eastern europe on a on a trip that had personal significance because i'm from a jewish background i'm not very religious but I believe in God, and uh, and I was trying to understand what what my Jewish heritage meant to me. And it was not long after the movie Schindler's List had just come out, and so by serendipity, I stumbled onto a hidden world of the Holocaust, and would end up not I didn't know it at the time, but I would end up being the first fine art photographer to document this hidden world of the Holocaust, which had been frozen in time for a half century behind the Iron Curtain. And most of my photographs of this hidden world were taken in Poland, not long after the Iron Curtain fell. And it was a very poor country. It had been frozen in time, but unlike other Eastern Bloc countries in the former Soviet Union, Poland, I think because of its Catholic background, had a certain respect, even though there were tensions that had existed for many years between Catholics and Polish, Poland is a predominantly Catholic country, and, and the former Jewish population that was all but wiped out, they, there was still a a certain respect they didn't tear the buildings down yeah they they may occupied them they m might have taken a um a former synagogue or jewish school and repurposed it as a gymnasium or a warehouse or maybe they would just leave it alone and let it rot like this synagogue in the in this photograph but um what what i found was this world frozen in time and it it gives us a direct connection to modern mass destruction. For example, this photograph, when I took it, I had no idea. It was just a gut feeling that I should take this photograph when I did. And then later learned from the famous historian, Sir Martin Gilbert, uh, Churchill's official biographer, who's also a Holocaust historian, that just behind this train was a large open air holding pen for tens and tens of thousands of Jews that were left out in the cold, starving, naked, you know, oftentimes with, with, you know, no shelter, no water, no food. They were, they had so many uh, people, they were pulling out of the cities, moving via rail to concentration camps, actually to gas chambers and ovens that they they needed uh, an overflow capacity to hold them well bef before they transported them and this was uh, a major holding pen where tens of thousands of people were moaning wailing you know just kind of going back and forth you know in, in you know in in psychic misery in in you know this almost a, a sense of a surreal uh evil you know, where they were, they lost their minds knowing they were just being, you know, taken to their deaths. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and there were all kinds of places like this, um, that I found. And so this was a total, uh, totally serendipitous discovery. These are murdered children's shoes. This is really emotional for me because since 1995, even through now, I, go to Europe and the former Soviet Union and walk the ground of remote corners where millions 
of people collectively have been murdered in modern times when civilized nations are transformed into weapons of mass destruction using mass media. And that's what happened in Germany, but in other places too. And at times I still find human bones on the ground of the murdered. And there's nothing more powerful than, than those days uh, because it makes one realize that modern mass destruction and genocide is not an abstraction. It's not an idea. It's real. I mean, there's nothing more concrete than a, a day like this when I photograph this human jawbone. Yeah, th this jawbone with a, a single tooth Dude. looks like it might be a molar, uh, yeah. so, some major tooth like that still present that is yes. definitely... It's the kind of image that stops you in your tracks. And yeah. we've got good texture, good contrast, all these things that are emphasizing and maximizing the interpretation of the image. But certainly the power of the image to me comes through in the fact that we have one tooth left. I mean, if you didn't have that tooth, I would be like, it's a bone. But all of a sudden when we see that tooth, when I see that tooth, I'm just like, it's a person. It's a, a man or a woman. I have no idea. Um, but it is, you know, this represents humanity and it is something that is so, so much, it, it takes you the other direction, I guess. It's, it, 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 it puts you there. It puts you in a, a sense of awe, a sense of reverence. Whereas if it didn't have that tooth to me, it would just, it, there would be so much left unanswered. I wouldn't know how to interpret the scene. And here we have this little vignette of, the, the wider scope of what you're talking about and what you're showing in these other images. So, so yes, this one definitely, it, it, it's a good, powerful, small item, but it's huge in its impact. Yeah, it, it, it makes us all realize how fragile civil society is and how history can turn on a dime. And mm -hmm. especially now what we're facing, you know, this is, this is what we're fighting against is, is, um, to lose civility and to let you know monsters uh, create anarchy and and there are monsters you know that people that lack conscience and we see them in the ER and I don't say this politically at all it's just that there you know there if we if we forget that that human nature is both light and dark and don't confront the dark side of human nature without any conflict you know it's like when the ER we at times may have a, a child abuser in one room and a two-year-old with a toy bead stuck in their yeah. nose in the next room. And we have to be fierce and kind. Yeah. We're respectful to everyone, but, but we're sober about human nature. And if we're not, people get hurt. Yeah. So that's, that's what, um, I mean, we just need to remember that, uh, we, we can't put, um, human nature on autopilot. We have to confront the dark side and fight for civility. Uh, every day in in small ways and in large ways so this is um this goes now to world war one and and so my my journey begins here in uh 2011 when i go over to europe on a scouting trip for a film i was working on and stumbled onto signs of World War I that gave me a sense that there was more left than people realized. And then okay. again, through a series of coincidences, I would be connected to a gentleman in the French government that uh, would become the head of the World War I commemoration. This is several years before the commemoration began. And he helped me to make connections all along the Western Front with local officials who then connected me to local people. And that was the key, was creating this network of uh, friendships that I built over time with local people that gave me access, special access to places that were kind of off limits. So this is a mountain battlefield road original from World War One that's wow. still kind of frozen in time. But it's um, it's on the surface and it's 
in a part of France near, near Switzerland and Germany, which is where, where there's a lot of um, remnants in the raw on the surface. Um, and you find these surface evidences of World War I that are pretty shocking because in our country, if we find one historic thing, you know, there's a marker and it's you know, made off limits. And, yeah. you know, there, there's just so much. It's, it's beyond belief. And, and so I'm still finding things on the surface. And then, yeah. um, uh, and well, then let's, let's, if, if, if we can go back to images, to those bunkers that, you know, this is, you're talking about the surface and, you know, we've got these rolling hills and all of a sudden there's a little brick wall and a window in that brick wall. And, you know, they just, you know, it, it's about using the terrain and, and, creating this this bunker area for survival but it still survives today which is amazing to me as well but it's also overgrown and the textures of grass and everything the trees you know it's just an amazing uh, presence about it cool. and it's it just it, it kind of puts you almost it puts you in that time frame it it, it does transport you i think the actually uh, the undulations in the ground are from heavy shelling. Okay. The, you know, the, the World War I was the first modern mass destruction, and they, they had high-tech weaponry. Yeah. With explosives that were so powerful that they didn't just kill you. If you were within a certain proximity to where a shell landed, you, you would not only die, you would disappear. Yeah. There would be nothing left of you. You would vanish. You, there, you know, you. That's how powerful the weapons were. So this is inside a former fort where tremendous violence occurred, and there are still these remnants. And, yeah. Uh, these were um, parapets from the uh, this fort, which had a component that was uh, underground. Now, in this case, it was not uh, the underground cities that we're going to see in a moment, but it was it was a a military structure that was built um, as a fort and, uh, you know, with some uh, underground, but uh, not the vast underground spaces that I uh, would soon discover. Um, so this was uh, actually the, um, the photograph of the day for National Geographic a number of years ago. Oh, all nice. Over. Uh, so, um, I wanted to mention that, uh, so I did find, I, I didn't find it, it, you know, it's known, but I was privileged to uh, visit a place where there were extensive tunnels created um, uh, on a hilltop, which was occupied by both sides for nearly the whole war, um, over four years. And it, it looks like a, a moonscape because what would happen is that the each side would burrow down deep under the other uh, side's front line and place these huge uh, explosive charges and then blow them to smithereens. Mm. And so there, um, there were 500 and some mine explosions over four years. And what was a hilltop with a village now looks like moonscape. But on, this is on the French side, and this is an intact railway with the electrical system. Yeah. And and so what, what uh, I know I met the people that discovered this about tw uh, thirty years ago, and when they found it, you know, it was kind of buried. The entryway was buried, and they were in tears because what they found was absolutely frozen in time and basically all they had to do was hook up the uh hook up power mm. and, and new light bulbs and uh in fact there were some of the old light bulbs that st are still there oh wow uh, yeah the journey goes from from that phase to uh, some more serendipity mass share sure uh, sure another... okay uh, so this photograph was a game changer so i I was on this six-week journey that had been arranged with the help of this gentleman at the defense ministry that I'd mentioned named Joseph Zimmet. 
And, and I was really kind of tired at the, I mean, I, I have a lot of energy and <laughs> kind of a workaholic, but I, it seemed like I, I was re- I just felt like I'm ready to come home. Yeah. And I almost canceled this last stop that he had arranged with the local official in part because I couldn't find any evidence on the internet that there was anything left from World War 1 of significance. So I decide just to be polite I'm going to follow through with the prearranged meeting and I meet this young man then in his late 20s named Dr. Frank Viltard. He just had gotten his PhD in history, worked for the French government. And and so the next day he takes me out into this farm field on a dirt road. We park and then walk and then go up a brushy hillside um, for a while uh, and finally reach this this uh, dirt mound and go up and over it. And then when you go over it, oh my gosh, there before us was this large space cut horizontally into a hillside Mm. that had ceilings that were maybe 10 feet high. And it was a, it was, well, a relatively small World War I, uh, not an underground city, but, but an underground, um, a place where, where troops were domiciled. And, and so this was on the French side. And so I'm using my camera to kind of see what's there. And I had a hundred millimeter Zeiss lens and tripod and, and this beautiful classical carving of a woman's face, this profile, which could be in a museum, was relatively small, but with the telephoto benefit of the 100 millimeter Zeiss, I could see it more clearly. Mm -hmm. And this was the game changer because it was the moment where I realized, oh my gosh, there is this hidden world of World War I underground that is pretty much unknown. And at that moment, I committed to photographing it uh, and to learning how to photograph in darkness. And so I came back to the U.S. and uh, in between patients, like at night when the yeah. ER would get quiet, I was reading about how to photograph in darkness. But there really, there weren't any books. You know, I just had to kind of figure it out yeah. you know, by reading articles. And then I bought all this equipment ended up being way more than I needed. I, and I bought like two of everything and I brought <laughs> over to France 700 and some pounds of gear. On the next trip. Thank goodness the person calculating the, the, the charge, the excess baggage <laughs> wasn't good at math. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> now, anyway, you, you had mentioned you were there for, was it six weeks? And this was the last stop on that six week trip? That, that, that was the first trip. And what, so th- was or that the, first no, trip? Was that was, trip. okay. Trip. Okay. But that was also about World War I interested yeah. items. Okay. But this yeah. is where you found the underground kind of stuff. This was the end of the, of the six weeks. That was yeah. the second trip. And, uh, no, wait a minute. It was the second. It may have been the third. Anyway, I ended up practically sure. living in France for a number of years. Okay. I was there wow. about half the time and I would just go back and forth and back and forth. Uh, you know, That's dedication. The ER and do some shifts and pay the bills and then go back. And I became very close to people there, and they're still like family. And I even had a uh, a girlfriend uh, who's a, a dual citizen, works at the embassy. Oh wow! At uh, uh, the American embassy in Paris, and we're still very good friends. And um, and so it w- it was like family. It was very emotional, you know. Uh, became, uh, there, were, there was something very special and it was a privilege. In any case, so this, this photograph though started the underground discovery. And, and so we're only going to look at a very narrow slice of this hidden world, but it would end up becoming the 
centerpiece of the Smithsonian Institute's commemoration of the 100 year anniversary of World War I with an 18 month show at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington. All right. That was a, a coordination between, it was a collaboration between the American History Museum of the Smithsonian and the Air and Space. And, uh, and, and then followed by the current show at the African American Museum. So this is mm. the kind of thing I, I would end up finding. Now, this is in total darkness. And it was very complicated to create this photograph. It's not a photoshopped uh, photograph in terms of um, creating what isn't there. This is, a, this is precisely to the pixel what you would see, but it's total darkness. So there is a special technique of lighting that's uh, complicated. It's a studio technique I learned from a photographer named Harold Ross who is like a Marine drill sergeant, you know, and he would, he, I went and studied with him two times for three intense days each oh, wow. time. Nice. And, and got my rear end kicked both times. You know, he was just, he's brutal, you know, and as a doctor, you're not used to getting your rear <laughs> kicked by somebody, but he, you know, that was good. It was really good. And because the technique is unforgiving. If you, if you bump your tripod slightly, you have to start over again. Yeah. And I won't go into the technical details, but this is, this is one particular space. It turns out that, that what I stumbled onto was the existence of what were modern underground cities beneath the former trenches of World War I, where at any given time during the war, Collectively, tens and tens of thousands of soldiers on both sides lived, worked, survived. These were the only places where these powerful bombs that you saw earlier falling on the earth couldn't penetrate and where you had a, a chance of surviving. And what was so cool is that when the surface of the earth became completely dehumanized, that the soldiers on both sides recreated a human world underground. And that's kind of what we do. It's what, you know, we do now in, in Corona. The things that matter, you know, in fact, there's a saying that I love, which is when the power of the modern world disappears, all we have left is each other. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you see underground. The things that matter to people are the things that give them a sense of, of humanness. They're, you know, memories of home, notes to loved ones, jokes, sports scores, carvings of artwork and buildings and memories of home. And like in this, there were American troops here, hundreds and hundreds of them. And you see on the right side of the, uh, the photograph, an image of uh, an Amer like an American looking medallion. These were right. soldiers from Maine. And then in the middle, you, you can't see it very well, but um, let me see if I can. So can you see right here? Yes. Okay, I see so your red arrow right. pointing to an item that yeah. looks like it's posted to the end of one of these wall structures. It, yeah, it's a ship. It's like hmm. a, a sailing sh a ocean freighter you know and this is the kind wow. of thing that the soldiers from maine would know because they were living on the ocean wow. and then this is the other one you know that i was right. mentioning and and so you you see these passageways here and here and here and here and they just it's this complex network of um uh where where hundreds and hundreds of troops were and in fact we made a documentary uh on the smithsonian channel called americans underground secret city of world war one and it was largely focused here because not far from where i'm standing turns out are the only surviving traces that exist today of native american world war one soldiers oh my wow yeah 
and they weren't citizens until 1924. Native mm. Americans weren't citizens, but they were very patriotic, and they fought courageously for America. And what was so cool was that the way they wanted to be remembered, and that's really what a lot of this is about, is people saying, I was here. I was once a living, breathing human being, you know, not knowing if they would live till tomorrow. Yeah. Their instinct, you know, to create a, a sense that, you know, just to let someone know that you once lived, you know, it gets down to that basic a level of your sense of, of humanness. Um, and so they did not write their names because that's not the way they saw themselves as individuals. They saw themselves as part of an ancient tribal tradition. Hmm. And so, by, again, by serendipity, one of my team uh, making the documentary is a, a, a military officer from Maine, the Maine National Guard. And he went up to the tribal uh, headquarters of this tribe, which still exists. It's on the northeast coast of Maine along the ocean, the Passamaquoddy tribe met with their chief historian and the guy's eyes lit up when he said, Oh man, I bet. One photograph because what, what he saw was this ancient tribal symbol that dates back thousands of years. Oh my goodness. That's how they wanted to be remembered. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's that amazing. Powerful? That's powerful. Yeah. So I, I wanted to show you, these are, you know, when we're, when our lives are on the line, uh, we, you know, we think about spiritual things. We think about our mortality and, and we think outside of ourselves, you know. And so what you see underground is, are chapels all over the place. And they're, they're really gorgeous. Now, this is using that special lighting technique. So the, this is totally dark. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. Yeah. One inch. You can't, I mean, you can't, you could, you could have your finger right in front of your eye. You can't see it. It's okay. total darkness. So we have these different carvings into the rock. And now do, is the rock, is this just part of the bedrock that they've dug out? Or are these pieces of rock that have been transported to this location and the carvings were done? No, do you know the difference or? I do. Yes. Th these were ancient when I say ancient, these were hundreds and hundreds of year old stone quarries from which okay. the stone for castles and cathedrals and fortresses and homes oh, okay. was, was mined long before World War I. And it so yeah. happened that many of these underground spaces, and to give you a sense of how vast they were, one of them I photographed was under over 25 miles underground in one place oh my goodness 25 yeah. miles deep Twi no 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 Tw not oh no 25 <laughs> miles of, of length the you know, okay they, so the, maybe 20 one, feet one place. okay but it had 20 miles of, of no they were wide and, they wow. were like subway stations underground oh, wow vast and and they were very methodical and you could get lost in there and they're yeah. now in total darkness but what happened was that during World War I, it was a modern war. You know, they were, they, at that point, they were living in modern cities. And, and they brought the technology of the day, which would be electricity, rail, telecommunications, hospitals, food systems, theaters, chapels, synagogues, command and control, all of that underground. Yeah. They created these cities on both sides. And that's what they, so they carved the chapels into the limestone, which is relatively soft. And that's what we have here. And it's a world frozen in time. Yeah. And so this particular picture, you know, we have this gentleman kneeling and there's this arch over him. I'm sorry, say again. It's a uniform. He, he's wearing, this is a particular uniform of a French okay. soldier from the, okay. uh, it's called, they were called the Alpen Chaucers, the, the mountain soldiers. That nice. This is the uniform. Nice. And it, I, I really like this carving because it gives you a sense of two dimensions. You've got the, the arch over the soldier, and then you have this little depiction of these two trees outside. 
And so it gives you the this sense. I'm sorry. It's the Holy Land. It's, it's the, the Holy, Land. Holy oh, Land. Very nice. So yeah, it just it it really, you know, it it shows us you know who they are and what they did and and whatnot. It also shows us, if, to me, that knowing now that that's that's a depiction of the Holy Land, it shows us their dreams and their their desires of of peaceful you know spiritual things and it's all captured here in this one little area where these i multiple items are carved i mean you showed me like five images of all these different types of carvings oh there, there are hundreds yeah these are, these are just one small slice of i can't even be, begin i mean we we would we need another session if you want to do another <laughs> one on uh, on on uh these hidden worlds i'm happy to do it but now, i didn't want to over your audience yeah that's fine now one last question yeah do we know that the soldiers themselves carved these or were these carved so these no. were carved by the soldiers yes wow yes. That's there was nothing down there and except you know it was like an industrial space wow you know, on both sides and they created this because they were there living and but what what you you don't see in this picture is if you were to turn around and walk the other direction maybe 50 feet away is a wall with all these notches like and they're for laying your rifle up mm. you know, again, to hold the rifle upright yeah. while you go pray and then if you look to your left there is a stairway which now has been uh filled in partly with dirt but it was a stairway to hell so mm. it went you would go from the safety of the underground yeah to the trenches, not knowing if you would ever return alive. Sure. Wow. Mm. So it gives context of how these men would pray and then fight. Yeah. Wow. Powerful stuff. Yeah. So um, here's another one with the, uh, you know, the stairway to hell. Yeah. So this is a small stairway though, too, which I, I should expect it to be small because you know if it's if if the enemy were to come down, you want it to be. I would think, you know, easier to stop the enemy coming down. It's not That's like this right. wide stairway. That's exactly right. Mm. Yeah. So and it's right next to a shrine too. That's what's also yeah. You know, they would pray and then fight and go up to the yeah. It's three feet away. <laughs> yeah. Mean, that's right. Oh man. Yeah. It just you know you can you can put yourself in the shoes of the soldier in the yeah. in the minds of the soldier. And they had candles, you know, and they, they also had electricity, you know, or dim lights in here. And, and uh, so this is on the French side. And so, so now if we could shift gears. Yeah. Um, so fast forward, I've already discovered this hidden world. And uh, I'm, I'm now on assignment for the New York Times to do a a cover story for the Sunday travel section. And this image would be, it would cross the fold. It was really big on, okay. uh, on a cover story. Um, and, and so this is a German trench in another part of France. And you find these all over. I mean, it's just amazing how much is left. So um, when I was on that assignment, another part of the shot list was in a different part of France to cover the story of Sergeant York. So there was a famous movie made, Gary Cooper played Sergeant York, who was probably the most decorated American soldier in World War I. And it was, he, Cooper won an Academy Award for this movie. This is the actual place where the heroism of Sergeant York in capturing 120 or 30 German prisoners took place and and so you've heard of the world war one mud i you personally probably, haven't no well it was it, the mud was horrific okay and but i had a, a a recent experience with the mud because i'm driving a <laughs> a four-wheel drive volvo and i get stuck in the mud yes oh my so, uh, here's another serendipity story so i i don't speak french and i had to schlep back into the closest village which is like a mile away and and i found somebody who um actually this guy on the left i'd met him the day before he speaks broken english lives in that village at another a world war one site miles from this place 
and and he gets a friend of his with a logging truck and they pull me out all right and so uh after the crisis has passed they in broken english he said well on the other side of the village is a place where american soldiers once were housed but the owner is a bit crazy but if you get him on a good day maybe he'll let you walk around oh my and so it turns out the owner who's on the left and this is his son was a, a wonderful man he wasn't crazy <laughs> uh, but he was uh he was ashamed because his family owned this abbey since the french revolution and now he was basically wow. broke and couldn't keep it up and they just lived in a small part of the the whole complex and so they didn't let people go in so this abbey if you go back one more picture just to describe a little bit of the abbey i mean this is huge it's oh yeah it's it's, it's like a mansion just about I mean, it's just oh it's much bigger yeah Wait, look at this okay so now we're walking around oh my goodness and and so so the uh the sun says the wrong thing to me <laughs> he said you know in the attic are some inscriptions by americans oh my goodness and so i i politely but persistently asked him if he would please convince his father to let me go up there <laughs> yes please and let me go like the movie ghost oh. you know with the dust in the air and the squeaky stairs and oh the my. and you know you're separating the cobwebs and you're going up and up and up and uh and we get to the attic and then i photograph this oh my goodness jr lock 805th infantry st joseph's missouri wow and then a week or so later i'm on a different part of the western front hours away and uh i i had gotten a call that afternoon from a canadian radio station that wanted me to do an interview with them on a landline so i contact a friend who speaks broken english and he let me come over to his place and on his kitchen table do the interview and after i showed him this picture and he says in broken english jeff i think this is a black unit huh and, and so he was right and i discovered a book from 1919 and this is the guy wow he was in the red band this is jr Locke from st joseph's missouri looking back across time so now i was really curious about this inscription which turns out is to our knowledge the only surviving inscription from a black world war one soldier that exists wow today and and so so um uh there was another place <laughs> i'm sorry i, I love this image <laughs> sorry thank you this, this image is, came uh, on screen and i was like oh <laughs> let's this describe is, this, this image a little bit right now in, in okay. the show uh, we return fighting the african-american experience of world war one so i've been photographing this site which is again different you know far from the uh the, where the african-american soldier inscribed the inscription and that he was in a an all he it wasn't an all black unit it was a black they were black soldiers and they were basically laborers with white officers and there was a lot of racism in world war 1 intense racism and uh and so i'd been photographing this place got to know the farmer they they would store tractors and chemicals and you know all this probably carcinogenic stuff on yeah. the ground and you know, in these places today but um back then it was a small underground city you know it was a quarry and the reason you can see the light coming in at the end is because a bomb hit and and broke the ceiling mm. of this place and uh um uh so anyway uh, I I did some photographs, a number of them in this place. This was in the Smithsonian, the first Smithsonian show uh, in in seventeen and eighteen. It gives you a sense of what these guys were seeing. It's a dead soldier with a gas mask. Mm, okay. Or part the eyepiece of a gas mask. But certainly so, carved into the rock, just so 
folks who are listening only, yeah, this is carved into the rock. Yeah. yeah, and and so you, it's a skeleton, you know, with all the flesh eaten away, with just a remnant of the eyepiece of a gas mask. Really yeah. horrifying. It's yeah. Undoubtedly, what they saw, lying on the ground with human, you know, human remains everywhere. So fast forward. Now there's another coincident, a spontaneous, you know, um, serendipity moment. So I was curious about the African American inscription, and I'd started to see this name popping up as an authority on African American World War One soldiers named Rob D'Alessandro. He's a colonel, Colonel Rob D'Alessandro, and it turns out that. He wrote this book called Willing Patriots, Men of Color in World War I. And at the time, he was also the chairman of the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission. And he's become a very dear friend. And in fact, he was in the documentary we made, came over to France for it. And he's also the operational chief. I think he's the assistant secretary of the American Battle Monuments Commission, which manages all of the cemeteries and the mm. mon- the war monuments all over the world, military, U.S. And, and he's a, a historian and a, and a full colonel in the you know, army, now retired. But so um, uh, I got in touch with Rob. I'd met him just in passing at a ceremony in Washington, D.C. And then a friend of mine uh, on the World War I Centennial Commission connected us. And all this happened within an hour. So I wrote to him about the inscription. I sent him a picture. He said, yeah, that's probably the only surviving World War I African-American inscription. And, and I uh, contact the gentleman I mentioned earlier, Dr. Frank um, Viltart, who was the person that opened up this hidden world, the, the person I almost canceled the meeting with. Yeah. I sent him, you know, a little email saying, "Hey, wow! I just contacted contacted this expert on African American World War One soldiers, and Frank loves all the discoveries, and you know, he wanted to be kept in the loop on everything." And so, and he writes me back, and he said, "Jeff, you know this place that we've been photographing because he was the one who brought me here orig- originally." And he said, "I think some of the uh, inscriptions." were possibly a black unit. Oh, by the way, this, let me tell you this story. So in fact, I, I was on, uh, and people can go on my YouTube channel, and there's a, an interview at ABC headquarters in, in uh, New York City, where they do the nightly news. Mm-hmm. And so they, this was in this uh, interview with uh, Jim Avila, the uh, former White House correspondent. and. It's a, it's a very unique way of getting into this underground space. So and it, there is no other place I ever found on the Western Front with anything like this. So instead of a stairway from the surface in, there is a slide, you know, like, oh. like in a fire station where you, yeah. you slide down. It's not circular, but you would slide on your rear end into the underground space. And when you look up, just as you pop into the safety of the underground space, you see this. Oh, wow. It's not welcome in. It says, hell, come in. Wow. So this is in that ABC interview. And I had no idea <clears throat> about the significance of this place. And so then Frank sends me a photo. Fo- this is my photograph. He sent me a snapshot of this wall, which I'd seen before. And I never bothered to look into what 370th was. Yeah. And he was the one who told me, hey, it might be a black unit. So within, in, all in the same hour, I contact uh, uh, Rob again, send him the snapshot of this. And he said, Jeff, you have just, this, you have stumbled onto uh, the only trace of a black combat unit. That still oh, exists. wow. This was the underground command post of a unit called the Black Devils. Now, and you had mentioned before there were some black soldiers, but they were mostly uh, laborers. So this, right. is a, this is a different unit altogether, it's and this is a combat very unit. Different story. Very oh, my different goodness. Story. Wow. Show you. So you look, you see victory. 
Yeah. This is a 370th, but it's cut off. You know, USA, USA, uh -huh. USA. You know, very patriotic, very devoted to the country, um, a heart. And by the way, m there were more hearts on both sides carved mm. into the walls than any other symbol. So I get a meeting. You know, I've already gotten the, the first Smithsonian show lined up, and we're working on that. And the chief curator of the uh, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum was kind enough to make a, an introduction to someone at the African American Museum at a time when they were not taking meetings because they were working on trying to get the doors of the new museum open. But they gave me a meeting because it turns out they were working on the very story that would become the show that is open now. And here this guy contacts them and says, hey, I found a trace of the story they're working on. And, and it turns out, so this would indeed, it, this is the only surviving trace of a black combat unit. Now, why were they a black combat unit when all the units were laborers? Well, it turns out that, the, so there were almost 400,000 African-American soldiers in World War I. About 10,000 of them were in these four regiments, that, three of which were National Guard. They were volunteer units. And uh, another was a unit of draftees. And they, there, there were about 2,500 soldiers in each regiment. And so by serendipity, they were loaned to the French by the Americans. who mm. the, the French military was asking for some American reinforcements. They were asking for four regiments. Three of the regiments were on the ocean on the way over to France. And General Pershing, in a, a moment of indiscretion, I guess, he said, okay, you want some soldiers? Have these guys. You know, he didn't wow. know what to do with them because the idea was to get them. It was a bait and switch. These guys, as opposed to the other units, were, pro they were most of them were volunteers. They were promised combat. And the plan was to get them to France and then switch them to laborers. The first regiment that arrived before the other three were, was a unit that would later be known as the Harlem Hellfighters. And they were laborers for two months, doing backbreaking labor as stevedores, ditch diggers, road builders. They didn't even have the dignity of uniforms. They were given overalls. It was terrible. Wow. But the French treated these soldiers with dignity. And even though they, the soldiers couldn't speak French and had not trained with the French before, had not, I mean, it was, a, it was just a, an amazingly difficult situation. But it shows the power of what happens when you're treated like a human being. Yeah. You just, it brings out this immense reservoir of courage and decency and, and, um, and energy and, you know, an ability to confront the most difficult situations. And it turns out that these soldiers were amazing. Now this unit, there, it gets better because it turns out this wasn't just any black unit. The 370th was the only all African American unit in the US military hmm. with all black soldiers and all black officers. And 102 years ago, when they fought so patriotically for America, this unit was already 49 years in existence. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So it's an unknown story of African-American political power and self-determination. And when I meet with the chief curator of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, who is a preeminent African American scholar, halfway through the meeting, he says, Jeff, you have stumbled onto I have a dream before I have a dream. Yes. And then he says it again. And Rob D'Alessandro was in that meeting, and everyone was like, you know, it was <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> And, and so it turns out that this is an entirely unknown narrative on race oh. long before Martin Luther King is born, decades before, is this community of um, American visionaries that come right out of the Civil War. They were African-American Union soldiers from the land of Lincoln, Illinois, 
who form a black militia, an all black militia volunteer, just years after the end of the Civil War, right after Lincoln's assassinated. Mm. And, and so they become a community of success, one generation after another, men, women, you know, they succeed in every area of modern life, whether it's politics, medicine, law, banking, education, media, the military. And it's an Ameri it's, it's, they, it's the way they see themselves, not as victims, but as visionaries. And they were victimized, you know, and they lived in an America that didn't get them. And there were all kinds of problems. Yeah. But they never saw themselves as second class anything. You can see it in their writings, and I'll show you some posters in a second. So this is one of the images in the Smithsonian right now. And then I would go back to this place several times, numerous times, after I made this discovery. And uh, one time I, I was going to have dinner with the mayor of the village and his wife that is maybe five miles away from here. And, uh, and I had some time on my hands, so I go snooping around. The farmer let me go underground whenever I wanted. And there was this passageway that had been filled with junk, like mm. truck tire or tractor tires and, you know, big, you know, like barrels and all this yeah. junk. And somebody had cleaned it out a little bit, enough for me to make my way back into this room in the darkness. And it turns out it's chapel. Mm. And, and undoubtedly, the the Black Devils, that's the name the Germans gave this unit because of their fierceness in combat, worshipped here. And you can see um, the uh, that there's um, a primitive um, uh, carving of, uh, so you see the, the Christ, the figure of the Christ? See, there's the yes. head. Yes, I do see that and, now. And the... Uh, the arms. Yes. So we, we have a picture, a, a relief carving of a cross. And within that cross, we have little line renderings where they're carved out, where we have a, a somewhat crude looking head, but then we have arms and a little bit of a notion of the body and the legs and the like. And so that's immediately, I didn't see it, but when you pointed out to me, I absolutely see it. That's very cool. Yeah, and, and so this is in total darkness, and they worshipped here while the bombs were going off above. And, and so this is the underground command post of the Black Devils, and turns out that the only memoir of this unit was written by Captain William Braden, the Chicago uh, Baptist pastor that was the unit chaplain. And wow. He was a pastor before and after World War I, and he wrote this memoir. He, he undoubtedly led services here. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. It, 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 it makes it all, you know, so real. And so, you know, it, it's just, it's emotional. So, yeah. Uh, uh, then I found behind a large tractor tire this. And it's, there, it's probably the carving, the numbers are this high. And this is also in the Smithsonian. And uh, uh, now it's this high, over. you mean roughly 18 inches, I think you were gesturing about. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. The numbers are that high, and it's the 370th, which was the, the regimental number of the Black Devils unit. They were from Chicago. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. So just to give you a sense of how they saw themselves, this is a poster. It says, colored man is no slacker. <laughs> this is not about victimhood. Yeah. This is not about second-class citizenship. This is not about... You know, and it's not a propaganda poster. It's from 1918, after all of the recruiting was done. The soldiers were already on the way to France or in France, and that's when this poster is made. So this is the way they saw themselves as patriots, as Americans, as stakeholders. Well, and I love, too, you know, because I teach design. And so something like this, yeah, the, the flag is very prominent. The image of this officer as he somewhat embraces, I presume it would be his wife, and he's holding her hand. And these are very, you know, definitely positive, definitely strong type imagery. And the text is very, very small. Colored man is no slacker. It's very small. It, to me, that tells me they're more interested in communicating this image of what they expect and what they want to portray themselves as. And, and who they are. Yeah, who they are. 
and, and they're less concerned about you know the whether it's the 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 text anyway they're less concerned about that now maybe there's a literacy issue going on maybe there's other things that i don't know about but that that imagery is powerful and that's that's gorgeous i love that yeah Yeah. this is uh in the smithsonian show as well but i didn't know about this image i didn't know that it would even be in the show i uh, i found it on my own just by serendipity again um Mm. i found an ebay poster oh wow Nice. Yeah, and uh, and then researched it and, and and got a better rendering of it, and uh, and then in by the same publisher, in 1919, after they get home, look at this. This is yeah. called True Book. Again, it's how they see themselves. So you know they at the centerpiece is this father, husband, patriot. Yes. You know it looks like a George Rockwell. Uh, image, yeah, and they're admiring their their you know the father, their proud father and husband, and American, you know he, these are stakeholders, absolutely. And we've got you know to the side, but above him is Lincoln. I you know I just yeah. I, I love that notion. And then we have George Washington on the mantle, and then someone else on the mantle. Wilson. I would pres- say again, well, okay, Woodrow will yeah turns out real as a real problem. Okay, you know, he was very racist guy okay. but they didn't know it at the time yeah, yeah but, but, but Lincoln, you know the link the notion of father abraham was uh-huh. you know all over the you know african americans saw him as as kind of a savior you know as uh, yeah of course some, you know and uh, and they were living the lincoln's vision of freedom and then over here on the right uh is a um an interesting image that that symbol is uh related to you see it yeah so window. it's a yeah so it's um a reddish rectangle with a, yeah. a field of a white field in the middle and then a single blue star in this in the center of that yeah. area and the significance of that is that that it it's something that the families of soldiers fighting in the war d- proudly displayed in their windows hmm. It's a symbol of patriotism, yeah. dedication to country. Love it. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to conclude with this one photograph. This is using that same technique that you saw underground of photographing in darkness. Yeah. And so the, the chief curator of the Air and Space asked me to come up with an idea for an image that would be the entryway photograph for you know, the entire show. And that, you know, this is knowing that, I mean, the the air and space is the most visited museum in the world. And uh, something like, I don't know how many millions and millions of people would pass by this image. And it was a big responsibility. And I had the image in my head before I knew how to make the photograph. Yeah. And then I went to study with Harold and, uh, and, and learned, you know, how to, um, I mean, now it's hard to find a place like this because there are trees everywhere and the sure. trees, you know, block out the Milky Way. But, yeah. but this was taken about two to five in the morning um, uh, on June 26th, 2016. The show mm. opened in 2017, April. And, uh, and it turns out, ironically, that seven miles north of here, and it's another story, but I, I would end up discovering again by serendipity an amazing piece of history related to African-American uh, history in, in World War I. It, seven miles north of here in the middle of a farm field is a spot. And it, it's, it's the sacred ground for America. No one knows it's there. It's the, the place where the only time in American history since 1776 through today where you have two african-american heroes both dying in the same battle both nominated for the medal of honor Mm. and it was covered up initially Mm. Uh, and uh but these it was the way they saw themselves that was it these were the unit of draftees they weren't an all-black unit they were black soldiers and white officers from south carolina 
made up of cotton pickers. Hmm. And they were the most decorated unit of any of the black combat units with the most casualties by far. And these two patriots were cotton pickers. One of them would get the Medal of Honor during the uh, Bush One administration in 1990. He would be the first for World War I or World War II. But okay. no one knew that there was a second hero who also was nominated and who was denied because of racism. I have the document from 1919 where oh Pershing denies the medal. Wow. And, uh, and his story is even more compelling than the man who got the medal, the first medal, his, his fellow member of Company C. He, he's badly wounded. His name is uh, Private Burton Holmes. His weapon jams. He comes back through this hail of machine gun fire and shelling to the safety of the command post where he could have been treated and live. He refuses treatment, gets a fresh weapon, mm. goes back badly wounded through the shelling and machine gun fire to the front line where he fights until he dies. Mm. Makes a choice. Wow. It's his country. He's a stakeholder, even though he lives in a time when there is no civil rights laws, no veterans benefits, no social yeah. safety net. You know, he, what he has to come home to is more poverty, the Klan, Jim Crow, lynching, and yet he is a stakeholder. And it was the way they saw themselves. So it turns out that another finding, you can look at on the, you type in Gusky and Reuters, you, in 2017, it was the feature story for Reuters for Veterans Day around the world. I found uh, a monument a kilometer from where these guys died that sits right now unmarked in a muddy farm field. Mm. And cotton pickers paid a dollar a man voluntarily to have this monument made. And on the monument are the names of the two African American Medal of Honor nominees. Mm. Now, do you happen to have a there picture of that monument? I didn't include them for this, but yeah. I'm happy, to, you know, if you maybe another time or, or we can post them on, on the website. But yeah, yeah, that would be fine. Really emotional. And, and so they, they, they did something else that no one knew about. Even the Smithsonian didn't know about it. And again, serendipity. So this is a great last little tidbit of serendipity to share with your audience. So um, I, I find a book in a library published in 1928 by a white captain from this unit of cotton pickers. And it hadn't been checked out in a while, as you yeah. can imagine. And in the back of the book learned that it wasn't just the monument. They donated 75 cents a man to have a medallion minted in 1918 in Paris. And there were about 2,000 of them made, and I've found five mm -hmm. of them so far, one of which I donated to the Smithsonian, and it's in the show right now. Wow. And it shows us how they saw themselves as men and as an American, as Americans. So you look in the middle and in small scale, very clearly, it's about family. There's a man and a woman hunched over in the hot South Carolina sun picking cotton. Mm. And next to them is a palmetto tree, which is the symbol of South Carolina. Yeah. And then under the palmetto tree is a sharecropper's log cabin. And then in much larger scale, at the top of the medallion is a proud, forward-leaning African-American soldier in uniform leading a bayonet charge. Wow. That's the future. And then the words underneath in Latin, how sweet and noble oh. it is to die for our country, <laughs> our country. That kind of brings tears to my eyes. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, these young heroes show us all what it means to be an American. It's something deeper than race or class or education or material wealth that unites us all. Amen. Oh, <laughs> and you know, like you mentioned that, that fellow from the, um, the museum who said, you know, you've stumbled upon 
I have a dream before I have a dream. And I think everything that you've told me about these soldiers, it, it, whether it's that one who, you know, needed to have that Medal of Honor uh, awarded him, you know, for going back to fight the front line until his death. Um, the, you know, any number of these other soldiers, each of them had, I, th I think it's evident to me, they had that dream uh, within and that it's just incredibly powerful. And uh, so thank you for sharing these these stories and these images. It's just been an amazing journey to understand what's going on here. Well, yes, thank you again, Jeff. It's been just, I know I learned an amazing amount and I knew I would. And that's why I was, you know, one of these things. I just love learning new things. I love whenever we can mix photography and travel and history. I mean, that is just like <laughs> all of those important buttons are being hit. And I just am thrilled to have had this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank and you. I, I just can't wait to to get it out there for the listeners to enjoy it as well. So Thank you. Uh, many, many, many thanks. I really have just been floored. Thank you. It's an honor. All the best to you and to your uh, your listeners. And and I um, I hope that uh, they follow their gut. Yeah. And um, look for serendipity. That's uh, the key. I, yeah. Every single time you were talking, you know. Uh, you were pursuing this thing and then this little extra thing happened and all these connections that's what it's about it there's so many things that can just come about that we don't expect it's just we put ourselves out there we get involved in something and before you know it someone else is like hey come look at this hey come look at that and how many times did you have that on the french countryside of these people saying oh there's also this right. there's also that and yes. what you found is yes. profound it's just ah it's awesome Thank you. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening and watching. And until next time, happy shooting.